what is the future of Pope Francis? Uh, I have a theory about that. And I'm not going to teach this thing as, as a doctrine or whatever else, but I, I have a theory. Um, looking at everything that's going on and whatever, the, the Pope Francis has probably made more radical statements about, uh, you know, the Bible and whatever else and, and uh, come out and said that things need to be changed or updated and whatever else. And, and uh, I've seen conservative Catholics get very angry about the Pope. A lot of them are calling him an anti-Pope, an antichrist Pope and whatever else. And uh, I'm going to tell you right now, I believe it's going to get a lot worse. I think Pope Francis is there specifically for a purpose. Uh, you say, what's that purpose? Well, what is he? He's a Jesuit. What was the whole purpose of the Jesuit order being created back in the 16th century with Ignatius de Loyola? What was the purpose of the Jesuit order? Well, that would be the Counter-Reformation. Okay? The Reformation was, there's problems in Catholicism. We need to reform Catholicism which uh, is actually not really a scriptural thing. Uh, you don't reform something that's destined to be destroyed. All right? You can protest it, which I do. I am a Protestant as far as protesting things. But Reformation? <laughs> How can you reform something that's cursed? You can't. All right? You have to abandon it. All right? Uh, even in salvation, you must be born again. You don't just, uh, you know, I'll just fix up things through good deeds and good works and whatever else. Oh, no, you get, you got to be born again, spiritually born again. But, uh, you know, the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation was there to protest the abuses of Rome and to reform those things. The Counter-Reformation came along to stop these protesters and bring them back under the umbrella of Roman Catholicism. That was the whole purpose of it. And they used whatever means are necessary. Uh, the ends justify the means, I mean, uh, to, to the greater glory of God, uh, whatever, you know, all the different things that the Jesuit order says. Um, so how could they use Pope Francis? Well, I believe that Pope Francis is basically playing a game there. He's part of a, a system. I shouldn't say playing a game, but, um, and that is the Hegelian dialectic, or you could say good cop, bad cop, whatever else. Uh, you create two totally opposing things, and then you can create a compromise, okay? A thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Or good cop is saying one thing, bad cop is saying something else, and you have to make a compromise. You see how it works? Um, and of course, you have the two popes right now. You have Benedict the Sixteenth and Pope Francis. So, well, you know, what do you do there? How do you get the two, you know, together? Well, I don't think that that's it. I think that you have um, Francis is being used to really make Catholicism look ridiculous. And like I said, a lot of conservative Catholics are coming out very hard against the Pope right now, and they're saying that this man's wicked and things. And he's just going to keep on doing this, uh, these wicked things and saying some really radical statements and, and just really making a mockery of the Catholic Church. And uh, I believe it's for a reason. You see, because in the Catechism, it talks about that there would come in the end times a, a great man of sin, this you know, antichrist, essentially, anti-pope, if you will, and that this man would uh, eventually be defeated by the Lord. Well, now think about this. Pope Francis is there, and he is, a lot are calling him already the antichrist or an anti-pope, and what would happen if the real antichrist, described in Revelation 13, the beast, um, the man of sin, the son of perdition. It's not some kind of a, the papal system or something. You know, it's an actual man. He sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Uh, that's a man. That's not a system. All right. Uh, the, the, again, the Reformed theology is, you know, pretty ridiculous. Uh, they come out with this whole thing that the seat of the papacy is the Antichrist. <laughs> Nonsense. I believe that, it, that the, the system of the Pope, I believe that the Pope is an Antichrist, but the final Pope will be the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition. Uh, again, another big study. But I believe that the Pope Francis in the Vatican right now is playing bad cop. And what will happen is you will eventually have the Antichrist, the man of sin, come in and he is going to say, you've made a mockery of my church, you know, whatever, whatever. He's going to appear as Jesus Christ. I do believe that. A lot of people say, well, he's going to be Judas Iscariot and things like this. 
eh, you know, there's some good theories there. You know, Judas Iscariot, you know, the Lord is, you know, basically gives him the sop. You know, he's the son of perdition, you know, kind of a deal. Uh, or he's, he goes into perdition. I'll say it that way. Uh, there's some good arguments there, but I don't think his name's going to be Judas Iscariot. I think it's going to be Jesus Christ when he comes back, when, the, when this Antichrist guy shows up. Say it that way. Um, and I think he's going to look like the Catholic paintings of this Jesus guy. Because uh, Jesus Christ, there's no record of him actually sitting down to be painted or anything um, in the Bible. But just to show you kind of something that I think might reinforce this. And again, I'm not, I'm not going to teach this as doctrine. This is just my feeling. You know, they, I mean, Pope Francis could die and there could be another Pope or whatever else. Benedict could die. There could be another Pope before the Antichrist shows up that's even worse than Francis. I don't know. But again, I think the counter-reformation is they're using the Pope to be a bad guy so that they can bring in the good guy as the Antichrist. Daniel chapter 8, uh, verse 3 through 12. We'll read these verses here. Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram which had two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward, so that no beasts might stand before him, neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. Funny because the Pope is basically doing according to his will. He's not even following Catholic teaching a lot of times, going against the teachings of the Catholic Church. He does according to his will. Verse 5, And as I was considering, behold, an he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth, and touched not the ground, and that goat had a notable horn between his eyes. And he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river, and ran unto him in the fury of his power. And I saw him come close unto the ram, and he was moved with collar against him, and smote the ram, and brake his two horns, and there was no power in the ram to stand before him. But he cast him down to the ground, and stamped upon him, and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Exactly what I think the Antichrist is going to do when he comes and takes over, with Pope Francis being there, he's going to come in and say, you've made a mockery of my church, and you, you know, get down, step down right now. And a lot of Catholics would cheer that. Um, verse 8, Therefore the, the he-goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Um, yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And an host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. A lot of very um, interesting uh, symbology there and things. Um, obviously, it's not going to be some goat as, you know, the Antichrist or whatever else. He's called the beast. Um, you know, he's like a leopard and has a mouth of a lion and, and things and feet of a bear, I think it is. You know, it's symbolic, obviously. It's not going to be some guy that's actually a real goat or whatever. And, you know, there's obviously a lot of different ways to interpret this and these passages. And, and I'm sure people would say, well, I don't know about, you know, just, but just, the, the point I'm trying to make here is I believe that the Antichrist, when he shows up, um, he's actually going to be coming in and getting rid of somebody that's false. He's going to be coming into a system and saying, you're doing a horrible job. I'm taking over. And you see it there in Daniel chapter 8, verses 3 through 12, right there. So uh, what's the prophecy for the future then? The prophecy is that Pope Francis is going to get even worse. And I believe that it's, it's quite possible that the man that comes to replace him, that uh, is going to put him down and cast him down, in other words, is going to be the Antichrist, the man of sin. Could I be wrong? Absolutely. I don't know. Uh, I can't say that the next guy in is going to be the Antichrist. I don't know that. Um, but it certainly is shaping up that way. And uh, if you're a Bible-believing Christian, that should encourage you because uh, Pope Francis is not that in that great a shape and whatever else, I don't think he's going to be around another 20 years. Okay, so um, not predicting a date for the rapture or anything else, or catching up with the body of Christ, but uh, it certainly is interesting. So just a thought. Thank you for watching.